anyone have a question? Does anyone have a question they want recorded? <laughs> Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Stuart, my question, it's Claudia. My question is about karma and are we working through karma every day till we die? Are we constant, is that, and, and how do we well, let's deal put it with it? A little bit differently, Claudia. We're living karma till the day we die. And whether you get free of your karma depends upon how open you are inside. Yeah. If you can live your life being happy, being full of love, you get free of your karma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you are all kind of involved in all kinds of negativity and anger, and it really creates situations in the world that make more karma that we have to live through. The very fact that we live is karma. Yeah. Every action, every activity, everything we do every day, it's our karma. And the incredible thing about karma is that it can change. Most people, karma is, you know, some, you know, pre-determined way of living, and and and, and, and it is. But in that predetermination, there's also you know, room for somebody to really change, which is their karma, yeah. depending upon the work they do on themselves. A lot of people, well, what do I have to do anything? It's all predetermined. I don't, you know, I hear that from people, you know, and I say, well, you know, then don't do anything. Try to be happy with your lot, whatever it is. But it's also calmer to do deep inner work, to take it upon oneself to want a spiritual life, to make every effort inside oneself to change and grow. It's calmer. I think it's a good way to look at the world, you know, because it opens up every possibility in life for change, for growth, for living. And we don't have to get stuck in some, you know, you know, wearing blinders. It can only be this way because my karma says so. <laughs> it's bullshit. You know? That's an insult to God, because karma is whatever you do. You want to kill somebody, it's your karma. You want to love somebody, it's your karma, you know? You want to change inside, it's your karma. You want to make an effort to have a spiritual life, that is your karma. And the incredible thing is that all of these choices are available to every human being. But most people live their lives stuck in a rut. They're so conditioned to live in certain ways, they can never break free of it. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Ask questions. Stuart. Yes, is that's it, me. Is it okay to let someone go that doesn't want to let go of their karma? They don't want to change. Yes. They go back and forth. Absolutely, is it okay? Okay. <laughs> Absolutely okay. I mean, 
there reaches a point when you have to deal with people like that, you have learned everything there is to learn from them. And if they're not willing to make some effort to change inside themselves, there's a time when you say, no, I don't need this anymore. I will, you know, I mean, this goes on in relationships, you know, people, the relationship died 30 years ago. Well, we're living for the grandkids, you know, we do, you know, don't do the grandkids a favor, you know, it, they're exposed to a, a very sterile relationship. I mean, the funniest thing I have, one of the funniest things I ever heard was, this is really funny. I mean, I had a, a student friend once who was telling me a story about her grandfather who was 85 years old, married 50 years, divorced his wife, her grandmother. And all the kids, grandpa, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? This is crazy. How can, and he just looked at us, I just want to die in peace. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, incredible story, you know, I mean, what a realization at the end of his life. And it's enough for this drama already. What do I need to spend my life fighting with somebody? Your life is, I want to you know, just die in peace. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you know, it, it, I mean, there reaches a point where it's, you just have to say it's enough already. I don't need this anymore in my life. And you're not doing a disservice to the other person. You're probably doing them a service because if they don't dump on you, they're going to find somebody else to dump on. They always do. I mean, about a week and a half ago, I had to do that with somebody. I finally said, it's enough. It's enough already. And I just let go. I said, it's enough. And I made it very clear that it was enough. And I felt no guilt, no anything. It was just, this is enough already. How, how long, much longer do I have to take this from another human being? The, the, the key to this is, is there anything more to learn in this situation? Or is it just a royal pain in the ass? No? <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> and if it's a royal pain in the ass, you just say, no, it's enough. I don't need this anymore. Does anyone else have a question they would like to? The only people you can't do this with, and I truly honestly mean this, are your parents and your children. And I mean this, you cannot, I mean, even if your mother, father, kid is a royal pain in the ass, you got to get bigger than it. I mean it, because that is really karma that has to be worked out. And if you wind up working it out where that person is no longer a pain in the ass and you can find them deep in your heart and love for them. And I mean, it's such a major step in your spiritual life and growth that it really is a major step towards getting your freedom. Does anyone else have a question you would like to ask? So would I have a question? Uh, I was trying to think of how to phrase it. It's it's around you know, the desire to change and the actual changing, you know, um, 
is it like I decide I'm going to transform my attitude and approach in a way or a manner, um, yet there's failure in some areas, whereas when actual change take place and it arises organically. So can you just speak well, to- there's a, there's a void between the thought, the desire to do something and when it becomes reality. <laughs> And the only way you can cross that void is by doing the inner work inside you. Just saying to myself or yourself or anybody, I want to change. <laughs> you're going to change. You know, I want to change. And then you have to do the inner work to create a system inside yourself that really can change. I mean, we need the idea. We need the thought. I want to change. I want to live in a different way. I want to grow. I want to get closer to God. I want to transform my life. Yeah, we need that. But then we also need the realization that this, that it's not like walking in a room and turning on a light. You know, this from the desire, the, you know, the thought to the action, to the becoming, you know, from the thought to being, there's a void that we need to cross. And you only can cross that void if you do the inner work to get there. And both of them are important. If you don't have a need to change inside, you never will. But once you tap that need, then you have to be willing to do what you have to do in order to make it a reality. And that adventure is probably the most extraordinary adventure on the earth. I mean it. Going from, you know, I want to change to actually changing is, I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest adventures any human being can live through. It's a journey through yourself, an incredible journey through oneself. Ultimately, arriving at a place where there is change, there's real change. But both of them are necessary, the need to change and then the doing it, the actual doing of it, the work. And in doing the work, you're not gonna be very comfortable with your life. You know, it's going to make demands on you. You're going to deal with all kinds of stuff that you hadn't had to deal with before because you're going deeper into the unconscious and you're tapping wellsprings of energy that were never tapped before. And in that, those wellsprings of energy, there's all kinds of experiences. You know, it's like in the old, uh, you know, German and Norwegian folk tales going through the Mirkwood, going through the forest, the trolls, mm -hmm. dragons. I mean, that's what exists. I mean, it's all just metaphors with, for what exists in the unconscious of a human being. And when you start tapping that energy, you know, it's not comfortable. And once you get to the other side, you have your footing, so there's a comfort zone. I hope that's clear, you know, because this is so important, this, this kind of work. There's the idea of doing it, and then there's actually doing it. <laughs> the actual doing of it is work. And the only reason it's work is we're up against only one person that keeps us from doing it, and that's ourselves. We have to master ourselves. That enables us to do it. And when you go through this, you'll wind up running away at least a thousand times. What am I doing? This is crazy. What do I need? To I mean, I went through this. I mean, when I was with Rudy, oh my God, even after Rudy, for years, I still go through this. What am 
I need to sit here and do seven classes on Zoom every week. You know? What? What? I can just turn the computer off for God's sake, you know? You understand? And then there's that voice. Yes, you need to do this. This is making you grow. This is getting you closer to God. This is allowing you to do your service in the world. And that reality dominates and enables me to keep coming back and doing this week after week, after month, after year, you know? You understand what I'm talking about? There's always that part of us that wants to run away. Please try and sit still. If you move, it really disrupts the class. Uh, you know, and then there's the need inside. Well, I mean, when I was living in Rudy's house, for instance, it was impossible. I had no place to sleep. And I, I said, what do I? And then I finally came to this incredible realization, Stuart, you're not here to have a place. You're here to have a spiritual life. You are living in the house of perhaps the greatest teacher of the 20th century who allows you to get close to him and is teaching you in such profound ways that your comfort doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. You're here to grow, to learn. Now, this is something that most of you would just simply reject. But I knew as a young man, I needed this more than I needed a place to sleep. I remember I was, went to, a, we were invited, Rudy and I, Rudy was invited, he took me along to a friend of his house for dinner. And the friend said to him, well, how do those people live like that in the ashram? You know? And Rudy just chuckled and he looked at me and he said, tell him, Stuart. I said, look, I'm not there. You know, I'm there for only one reason, and that's to get the wisdom, the mastery of this great teacher who I've, God has put into my life. All the rest of it will change and it's just bullshit, you know? Then you tap the need. You understand? You're willing to, it's like Milarepa with Mapa, you know? Milarepa was a magician. He was a black magician. I think he was a murderer. He was kind of a crazy guy when he was younger. And he knew he had a change and he, and he went to Mapa, one of the great, Mahasiddhas in the history of Tibetan Buddhism. What should I do to change? Well, build me a house. My wife and I need a house. So he spent a year building a house. When he finished the house, he said, Mapa, here, I don't like the house where it is. Tear it down and build me another one on that spot. He built 13 houses for this guy. 13 houses. I mean, what could have been left of his ego? Nothing. Nothing. Became the great poet saint of Tibetan Buddhism. Really. They always paint him with his hand to his ear, listening to probably the Om sound in the cosmos, you know? I mean, he became this great saint. He was a murderer. He was a magician. He was a dark person when he was younger. Does anyone else have a question? I mean, this is tough stuff, I know. But, <laughs> you know, you have to talk about it because getting to God is, is a very, very rock and roll journey. And one has to have a need that's so deep you're willing to pay any price to get there. Whatever you have to go through. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? How do you always know where to go and what the price is? You know, getting to God, it seems like a very big kind of ambiguous thing. What do you mean? Um, well, I'm saying how do you check in and, and really know what your next step in the, in the journey is? Like what, what's needed? What, what do you need to do? Look, you know, Zach, you know, 
one thing. I want to have a spiritual life. I want to grow. I want to have a spiritual life. I am reaching to God for whatever I have to do to have a spiritual life. I knew when I was younger, even before I met Rudy, I wanted a spiritual life. I didn't know how to do it. And I went through nine of the most horrible years. It was horrible what I went through in those nine years, winding up in a prison in Spain, you know, for trying to smuggle some, you know, hashish, you know, from Morocco into Spain. When I got, and, and I knew when I was there, I said, Stuart, you have reached the end there. You can't get worse. It can't get worse than this, you know? And when I got out of that place, I kissed the ground. Three weeks later, I met my teacher, Rudy, because I knew something in me had to change. I knew I had to change. I didn't know where the change was going to come from. You know, I had no idea that it was going to be Rudy. Anything. I'm walking down 7th Avenue South with a friend of mine past his shop. Let's go in. Well, Charlie, I'm broke. What are we going to do? This stuff cost a fortune. What are we doesn't cost to look. It was the greatest thing that anyone ever said to me in my life. It doesn't cost to look. I walked in the door and there was Rudy. My whole life changed. I didn't know. I had no idea. I was going out to have a Mideastern meal in a restaurant we liked in Greenwich Village. My whole life changed. And then to seal the deal, when we went back to this guy's apartment where I was sleeping on the floor, so I didn't have 50 cents to my name at the time. You know, we're walking up the stairwell, right? This is an hour and a half after I met Rudy. And this guy named Ed Borden, who I knew, you know, I used to say hello to him on the stair. He said, why don't you come in my apartment and have a cup of coffee? This is a true story. So we walk into his apartment and we took about living in a slum, you know, bathtubs in the kitchen, toilets out in the hallways, you know, it was a, you know, a tenement building. Guy has a half a million dollar collection of Asian art <laughs> in his apartment. I mean this. And I looked around, I said, oh my God. I said, where'd you get this stuff? He said, well, there's a guy in Greenwich Village named Rudy. When I met Rudy an hour and a half before this. You know, I know that Ed Borden was going to seal the deal. <laughs> I had no idea. I said, Stuart, the gods are talking to you. You got to go back to this person. There's something there that you need for your life. I never took it for granted. I never assumed anything. I said, you have to go back there and find out who this man is and why you met him. But there was nothing in my mind that ever thought these things were going to happen. But when they did happen, I never took them for granted. I knew that unless I do this, I knew what my life would be. I need to learn from this person. My whole life has been this way, you know? I mean it. I don't make plans. I mean, you wanna to go to the movies, call me up, you know? <laughs> I don't make plans. I mean this, I, I never, plans and this. Life just happens. But you have to be smart enough to when God gives you these blessings, you, all right, what am I here for? What do I have to learn? What do I have to do to grow in this situation? And frankly, the first year in, with Rudy was like a romance. It was a romance. You know, after that, the going really got tough. When he began to see a little bit of stability in me, he began to, I mean, it was incredible, the stuff that he put me through. I mean, I won't get into any of the stories here, but I'm, trust me, it was amazing. And the more difficult they were, the more I learned and the more I grew. I grew. Instead of running away, I said, okay, what is this? And I, and I made it work for me.
How did you uh, continue to to find your edge uh, after Rudy passed? After what? After Rudy passed. Oh man, you know, when I, I was in that plane, you talk about another experience, you know, when it hit the mountain. And my first thought was really, thank you, Rudy, for letting me be with you at this, the moment you took your samadhi. That was my first. My second thought is, Stuart, now you'll find out what the last six years were really all about. And that was my second thought. And my third thought was, Stuart, you are a living miracle. Your teacher passed his soul into you, soul force, and kept you from dying. And you are responsible to do, you know, to do God's work in the world. That's how. I never felt he was gone, frankly. His soul was inside me. It's still inside me till today. But I also recognized my life is a, a miracle. I see myself. I shave myself <laughs> in the morning. And I see a living miracle. And I never take my life for granted. And it's why I do the things in my life. And I, I've learned that God always sends you what you have to do. And if you're conscious and you know, you understand it and you never take the gifts for granted. I mean, I, after that plane crash, I could have said, well, you know, fuck this, who needs this? You know, I mean. I mean, my God, I was almost killed. Like, and, and people do, you know? They, they go out of the most horrendous. They, you know, I used to do healing with people and, and basically save their lives, you know? And I would see them go right back into the same pattern that created the disease in the first place. They couldn't let go. I used to tell them, you've got to change. you got to leave where you're living. you got to just completely renew your life. Well, how can I do that? I had a cousin, you know, this is a true story. I mean, I went home to visit my family for a Passover ceremony. And I used to go once a year for this. And uh, my aunt comes up to me and says, you know, your cousin Sandy is in the hospital. She has a very serious cancer. They've given her like a month to live. I know you're into all this stuff. You know, is there anything you can do? So I'll never forget, I went to the hospital the next day. I walked into her bedroom. It was scary. I hadn't seen her in 10 years. And she was lying in bed with a belly. You know, I mean, it was ridiculous, you know. And she had a liver cancer that had metastasized to other areas of her inner organs. And I looked at her and it just broke my heart. And I said to her, the first thing I said to her, Sandy, do you want to live? And she said, yes. And we started doing the inner work. And it, a week later, you know, not even a couple, anyway, what happened was the whole cancer went into remission. A person who they had given a month to live, they released from the hospital to go live her life. You know, they had her on certain kinds of chemotherapy and stuff. And I said to her, I'll never forget this. This was like an education. He said, Sandy, why don't you come to Texas for six months? Just come down there. I'll teach you this. You can learn this, you know, and it'll give you a life, you know? And she said to me, Stuart, I can't come. I have a husband, I have children. How am I gonna go to Texas? You know, she died a year later. It broke my heart. And that's how people function. They go right back into the exact thing that created the crisis in the first place. They can't move out of their life. Instead of saying, oh my God, look what happened. I'll go to Texas. I'll go to, I'll go to the moon for God's sake to learn this. If it's going to give me a life. So, I mean, I'm just talking out of experience. I'm not talking because I read about these things in a book, you know? 
This is from my life experience, the things I've been through with people. It's like Rudy Stewart, I'm gonna to move to the Middle East, are your bags packed? He used to ask me this every day, are your bags packed? We're gonna be moved to, you know, he never even asked if I wanted to go. And I never thought about moving to the Middle East. Whoever dreamt of living in, you know, Egypt or Saudi Arabia or a place like, and he, are, you, are your bags packed? We're gonna be going soon. I said, fine, I'll pack my bags. You just tell me when you want to go. I knew I had to be with him. And if it was in, you know, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, I didn't give a shit. I said, I wanted to be with him because this man was giving me my life. This was the most extraordinary teacher of the 20th century. And he was making it possible for me to be around him. Does anyone else have a question? I hope this is kind of clear. I'm sharing with you my life, things I've been through, things that have allowed me to grow and to be open enough in myself where I can even talk about these things. You know, because this is really, it's not me, it's this higher energy that is, that's talking. And maybe it'll touch you someplace so deep inside that it'll allow you to have the kind of changes that took place in my life. And everyone, they always say this, everyone's life is unique. You know, you're not gonna live in a world that I lived in. You have your own reality. And the uniqueness of one's life is what makes each and every one of us wonderful. But we all need energy. We need to be connected to spirit because that's where the fuel comes from that enables us to grow and have a conscious life. And then in order to have that connection, you gotta do whatever it is you have to do. I mean, the Buddha spent you know, 40 days and nights fasting in the desert, Christ struggling with the devil in the desert. You know, the greatest tea, you read the hagiographies for these great saints and you find out what they went through in order to have their connection with God. And it doesn't deny us love and joy. And you know, there was nobody more fun for me to be around than Rudy. It was a kick. You know, it was a kick. I never knew what was gonna come out of his mouth. He used to crack me up. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Stuart? Yes. I wanted to thank you tonight for so many examples of total surrender. Thank you. You're welcome, Tony. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Look, this is my job. I have to share these things with all of you. And I'm hoping that it penetrates and it really finds a home inside. And then you can trust karma, you can trust life. And above everything, you can trust God. That that energy will, I mean, it's just, it's an, uh, miraculous what it does, you know? So God bless you all, and in all humility, I have to say thank you. Because honestly, I listen to this stuff also. It's not Stuart talking, this just comes through. I channel this energy, it comes through this way. And you notice, when I talk this way, I don't even cough, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy once told me, you know, you can be tired on your own time. You can't be tired on God's time. And he was right. <laughs> you can't be tired. You can come to these classes dead tired. And by the time they're over with, you know, it's like you're, you know, like you're five years old. The whole energy is reborn. Okay, it'll be class on Sunday.
God bless you all. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody then. <clears throat> One last thing, you know, I told people, if you want to come to New York or to Connecticut, I'm I will have private classes, well, not private, but I will have classes with people in person. <clears throat> but you have to check with me, you know, because I, I honestly can't do more than two or three people at a time. I don't have the space here, and I and also I have a daughter who just got an amazing job, and I don't, and she's working at home, and <clears throat> I don't want to do anything to interfere with that. But if you want to come, let me know. We can work it out. Bless you all, and I hopefully I'll see everybody on Sunday. Thank you, Stuart. Bye. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very beautiful.